G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. And uh, today's video is about reviewing the teams that all missed the finals now that it's all done and dusted. Just finished watching Carlton versus GWS, pretty thrilling end to the season. And now we're left with 10 teams who failed to make the finals in 2023. So the purposes of today's video is to review them and give them a letter grade and see how they went against preseason expectations, maybe highlight some positives and negatives, and ultimately decide if it was a positive season for them uh, or not. And it does appear that having done the uh, script for this video, a lot of disappointed teams there this year who really failed to hit expectations. A lot of teams that are really that were expecting to make finals should have made finals and failed in the end and therefore I have marked them pretty harshly. Plenty of content to come out throughout the channel. Obviously the final series is about to kick off and I have a number of videos planned for all the finals action as well as keeping up with the trade and draft scene. But today we're going to take a retrospective look at the seasons of the 10 teams who missed the finals. So let's crack into it. So we're going to start from the bottom of the ladder and move our ways up which means that I have to start with the West Coast Eagles and they obviously finished 18th. Preseason expectations, well, uh, I know that I had higher expectations than in general. I'll try and keep it more broad and neutral. And so what I mean by that is I think most people still expected the Eagles to finish bottom two. I would have set an expectation is to get close to getting out of the bottom four. That's probably a nice midway point between what I was hoping as a uh, bias fan and what the general mood on us was. I think the Eagles trying to avoid the bottom four was a good preseason expectation. But either way, they failed that miserably. In terms of some season highlights, obviously most recently their win over the Dogs, uh, any of their three wins really. Probably the two better wins were the Dogs and the Giants, and uh, it's hard to pick apart some of their season lowlights because there's just so many of them. But you put Sydney, the big loss to Sydney by 171 points right at the top. Adelaide, Hawthorne, and Fremantle all in there. And there was one team that didn't make the cunt that... <laughs> There was one 100 point loss that didn't make the cut in Carlton because uh, frankly, there were just four worse losses. So we will try and look at some positives. I think their best form was respectable. It was just too few and far between, but the, the form against the Bulldogs did show that there was actually a half decent side in there. And even against Adelaide in terms of the, the effort that was put in, I think in general as well, we've demonstrated an ability to adjust to a new game style. That's one thing that we probably didn't show in 22 and certainly not in 21. The game plan's changing and we saw it click at times, which I think is a general positive. Positive. I think the mid-tier of the list improving a lot. Bailey Williams had a great breakout year. Oscar Allen you still include in mid-tier. By mid-tier, I mean age. Probably the weakest part of the list. So to have uh, Bailey Williams, Oscar Allen, Jermaine Jones, uh, Jake Waterman before he got ill, and even someone like a Witherden sort of improve on their games and take their game to the next level is a positive. Tim Kelly had an unbelievable year, and the other positive I had is that it's a good year to have pick one. The negatives are the injury list. It's the third year in a row we've been decimated by injuries. This is arguably the worst of it. So, you know, we've speculated in the past whether it's systemic or what, but it doesn't matter. It still happened, and it really needs to improve. The attitude and the terrible losses were beyond pathetic. Percentage got worse on last year, and uh, in general, specifically scores from stoppage was, um, you know, we were almost record-breakingly poor for that stat. So overall, I'm going to give the West Coast Eagles an F. I don't think that should surprise anyone. Then we've got North Melbourne, who finished 17th, and I'd say their preseason expectations are probably to improve enough to avoid the bottom four. I think that's realistic. Uh, first year under Clarkson, they ended up finishing 17th, of course. Look, it was a weird year for North Melbourne. They started the year 2-0 and under Clarkson and, and uh, had beaten the Eagles. And I watched my review of that game back when it happened. And I remember thinking that it was actually a pretty half-decent game of footy. Both teams looked a lot better than what they would ultimately dish up in 2023. And then to beat Fremantle and Perth, a team that came fifth last year, uh, that, those were really good wins. And then I suppose to finish off the year in the way they did is uh, positive. It shows that there's still a desire to win underneath it all, even though if it was a bit of a dead rubber. Um, but in terms of positive, talking about some individuals, Harry Shears was probably going to win the Rising Star. Outstanding season. Nick Larkey kicking 70 goals in a team like that is an unbelievable achievement and probably deserves to be All-Australian. They've reintroduced Taron Thomas back into the side and I thought he had a pretty good end to the season as well. But you know, even superficially they've improved by 16% and uh, I think they've actually got an extra win on last year as well. So there's some level of improvement there, but it is a very low base. The negatives would be their the 20 game losing streak. They found it very, very hard to generate inside 50s. I think they're another team of quite a few in this bottom 10 that uh, had a really inconsistent level of effort and we saw the gap between their best and the worst this year was pretty poor and that's the issues they have is going to be exacerbated by the likely loss of Ben Mackay as well so overall I'm going to give North Melbourne an F as well sure they improved but they didn't improve by enough we'll go to Hawthorne now who uh, the preseason expectation uh, I think I think they finished 13th last year this one was a bit murky I've, I've commented on this before several times about how hard it is to rate 
Hawthorne in terms of what we expected preseason because they offloaded a lot of experience and went into this year bracing probably for a low finish. So I'd say their expectation was probably a bottom four finish. What was their goal? I'm not really sure, but I'm sure that a close to wooden spoon finish would have been uh, pretty unacceptable for them. But the good news is that they actually had a pretty good year for a team that came 16th. There was a lot of high points. They beat Collingwood. Uh, they smashed West Coast by 116 points. The reason I highlight that is because at the time, Hawthorne were actually bottom of the ladder and it really demonstrated how much better they are than West Coast and North. They touched up the Lions at the G. They had a good win against the Dogs down in Tassie in terms of their losses. Probably the worst losses they had were at the start of the year, round one and two against Sydney and Essendon really stand out. On the bright side, they've shown that they can match it with some of the best teams. James Sicily probably had a career best season. Should be a lock for that All-Australian defensive position. Their midfield performance, despite getting rid of Mitchell and O'Meara, actually, I don't know if it improved statistically in the end, but it felt like they were still a pretty strong midfield team. They conceded at least clearances, which I I found an interesting stat as well. They were second in disposals and fourth in marks overall. If you had to highlight some negatives in what was a fairly decent year for the Hawks in terms of the eye test, uh, they technically dropped from 13th to 16th and had one less win than last year. But anyone who's really followed their narrative closely this year, in particular their back end of the year, you'd say it was a productive year and there was some development there. So other than the terrible start to the year, that's probably what cost them a higher spot on the ladder and probably inconsistency of efforts probably in the last you know month of the season as well, particularly that round 24 clash. But they are a young side and that's to be expected. So I found it really hard to grade Hawthorne based on not knowing what to expect of them this year. But I gave them a C. The lows weren't great. They didn't improve but some really, really positive signs as well. So I think that's probably the year they were hoping for. B seems too generous for a side that dropped three spots and finished third last, but uh, agree to disagree. Then we've got the Gold Coast Suns who ended up finishing in the bottom four and it's fair to say their preseason expectation would have been to, uh, I put top 10. So what that mean? That means they're uh, in the thick of a finals. If they missed out, it's not the end of the world. Season highlights, they beat Richmond at Marvel, which seemed like a really good win at the time. Uh, the Dogs in Darwin, that was a good win. They also beat the Lions and Geelong this year. So they've shown an ability to match it with some of the better teams in the comp. They were pretty poor in round one against the Swans. They lost to North in the final round and they were particularly poor against Collingwood who are admittedly the benchmark of the competition. Remembering that game, I think Collingwood kicked like the first eight goals or something like that. It was a pretty poor showing. So that was highlighting some of their worst losses. What are their positives? <laughs> probably that Damien Hardwick is their new coach. That's probably the biggest positive. So Jack Lacocious, the form of him, um, alongside Ben King actually. So they combined for 79 goals between them. 39 to Lacocious, 40 to Ben King. Uh, particularly when you consider Ben King's off come off that ACL and Jack Lacocious led their team in goal assists. I think that's a really, really positive and successful move to the forward line for him. Uh, the anderson Rao combination, you know, where Took Miller was obviously missing for large portions of the year. Anderson had a good year, averaged 27 disposals. Rao was first in tackles in the league this year and fourth in clearances. Charlie Ballard is another player I highlight as having uh, probably a breakout season. He's sort of been on this consistent incline in terms of production as far as I can tell, uh, but he's an outside chance to all Australian, potentially makes a squad if that hasn't been announced yet. They were a top four clearance team statistically and the other positive I'll put is the amazing academy position they're in with respect to this year's draft. The negatives were that they were nowhere near finals and that was their expectation and that's evidenced by the fact that they got a new coach. So we, we already know that. A huge gap between their best and worst. Obviously some of those good wins were quite positive and uh, you know when Gold Coast didn't show up this year it was truly, truly poor. Took Miller doing an injury didn't help although I did highlight as a positive that they kind of covered for them him in the midfield pretty well. Um, ultimately, they dropped by three spots. I'm giving Gold Coast a fat F. Then we've got Fremantle, whose preseason expectations would have been to probably just make finals again. They finished five, fifth last year. They're one of the younger teams in the comp. I think it would have been unreasonable to expect them to jump into the top four or anything like that. So consolidate finals was their expectation. Obviously had a lot of turnover last off season. Talking about some of their highlights this year, they, they had some really good wins, particularly on the road. So they beat the Cats at GMHBA and the Ds in Melbourne and the Swans away as well. So three wins where typically Fremantle I can show that they can match it with the best on their day. Uh, their worst losses, they lost to North Melbourne in Perth. They lost to the Dogs really badly in Perth. Got humiliated by the Giants and the Blues as well. Obviously, the Giants and Blues emerged to become pretty good teams in the back end of the year, but ultimately, they were both pretty uncompetitive performances, which I think is symptomatic of, uh, of the broader issue here at Fremantle. Positives, Jai Amos is the clear biggest positive this year. 41 goals. I think he's one of the youngest players or youngest Dockers to hit 40 goals. Anyway, 41 goals as a second year key forward. That's really impressive. He's playing well above his 
his uh, pay grade, that's for sure. Caleb Sarong's also probably put in the best uh, season of his career. Should be All-Australian. Outside chance for Brownlow, maybe top five. Um, the positives are as well that they're still a young side. Uh, I think the fourth youngest side, at least going into this year, they were the fourth youngest side. So some of the signs they're showing and the young talent they've accumulated is really positive. I think Luke Jackson proved to be successful. Introduction into the team this year, obviously, uh, whether it's a su successful trade is based on how his career goes. But... He kicked 22 goals and obviously there was always question marks with Luke Jackson, where does he fit in? But I think his forward craft was at an acceptable level. Uh, if he's kicking 22 goals a season and influencing in the ruck when Sean Darcy's down, which he definitely did, uh, I think that's successful. But they've had a couple of late pick strikes as well. Tom Emmett finished the year really strongly as well. So it looks like David Walls has done it again at Fremantle potentially. Uh, the negatives, they conceded the third most inside 50s. That's probably not the first one I should have led with, but I found that an interesting statistic. But I'd say primary Primarily a huge gap between their best and their worst. Some of those losses this year were really, really listless. We saw a little bit of stagnation in guys like uh, Brayshaw in particular. And didn't have a bad year by any stretch, but obviously what was the MVP last year or the year before? You can really feel the difference when Andy Brayshaw is not playing at his absolute A-grade potential um, and someone else like Frederick. Overall, how do you rate Fremantle? I'm going to give them a D. I can't give them a C when you drop from fifth to fifth last. But considering their age profile, the nature of how much their list has changed over the last you know 12 months, were they lose like 25% of their list according to Drewsy. I'm giving it a day. It wasn't a great year, but there's plenty of positives. So we'll move on. Now we'll talk about Richmond, whose preseason expectations should have absolutely have been to play finals this year. Obviously finished seventh last year, uh, being knocked out by the Brisbane Lions, then recruited Taranto and Hopper. And I know that this move would have been partially for the long term as well as the short term. But when you trade out of two drafts for two established 25, 26 year olds, you should have some expectation on your team being relevant the following year. So to miss finals, I think, and actually finish 13th, is quite a poor result. Their best wins this year, they were one of the few teams to beat Adelaide in Adelaide. They looked good when that happened. They beat the Cats at one point. They beat Fremantle and Perth. And they had some poor performance as well. They lost badly to the Lions at the Gabba. They uh, lost to Gold Coast in Melbourne for a team that was competing for finals at the time. That was a poor loss. Their loss to the Swans at the G at the time was also quite poor. But positives, you know, while I just highlighted the Taranto move, I think he actually obviously had a very good year in his first at the club. Dustin Martin also put in a very, very good season. Uh, probably under underrated if you're not watching a lot of Richmond games. He had the most disposals ever by a forward that spends more than 85% of his time as a forward. So as a pure forward, they had the most disposals ever. Um, what I would say as well as a positive is that I know Richmond's aware of this transition they're going through. How could you not be? Um, and there was a bit of exposure to youth. So guys like Samson, Ryan look good. Thompson Dow's got a bit of an opportunity. Tom Brown, Trezies, oh, forgive me if I'm saying that wrong, and Sam Banks all got opportunities. Negatives, well, broadly, they went from being sixth to be a non-realistic finals contender. Uh, on top of that, their draft position is not great, having traded away. They're the most clanger-riddled side this year and actually ranked 17th in opposition clangers. So that kind of suggests a, a pressure issue if they're not forcing clangers, but they're also making a lot of their own. Their highest goal kicker this year was Tom Lynch with 32 goals, which is obviously not super effective. So just... Uh, suggesting a lack of real goal scoring threat this year. I guess ultimately as well, you say end of an era. Uh, that was always going to happen. Richmond can't really control that. But that's what this year kind of signifies, especially with Cochin and Rewalt, etc. retiring. So Richmond, ultimately, I'm going to give you an F because the preseason expectation was to perform well this year. And you didn't. And they're one of a few teams I'm giving an F to. And uh, yeah, they may seem harsh, but if you load up, they should have probably been a top six team this year and they failed miserably. Next, I've got the Cats, who obviously finished 12th. The reigning premiers missed the finals. We almost had both grand finalists miss the finals this year. Their preseason expectation should have been top four. They're a hard one to judge because you always feel like Geelong is on the edge of their era ending, and they keep proving us wrong. So when it finally happens, we can't really be too surprised, I suppose. But it may or may not be the end of an era. I'm not actually suggesting that yet. Let's look at their best wins this year. They smashed Sw uh, Sydney at GMHBA by 93 points. That was a huge statement at the time. They beat the Demons this year. They also beat the power later in this season. They had some poor losses too. Losing to Richmond in the way they did. They lost to the Gold Coast Suns earlier in the year. Had a really poor start to the season. And then uh, obviously losing at GMHBA late in the season when finals were there to be taken. We'll highlight some positives. Uh, Jeremy Cameron, uh, you know, when he was on the park this year, had an uh, unbelievable season. At different times this year, has been considered one of the best players in the competition. So you've got to give uh, some acknowledgement to that. Tom Stewart also had a wonderful year. Brian Myers is an outside chance to make the All-Australian forward line. Um, obviously, he doesn't kick a lot of goals himself, but famously gets a lot of goal assists. He's been sensational. Percentage of 112 suggests that they were a lot more competitive and, and at times dominant than their ladder position would suggest. They were also fifth in points per game as well. So they were still hitting the score 
scoreboard. On top of that, obviously they're going to, you know, similar to Richmond facing this transition period of, um, you know, uh, literally a premiership side now. So some exposure into the guys like Ollie Dempsey, Max Holmes, he was already in the side anyway, Shannon Neal, Toby Conway, Mitch Nevitt, uh, Henry. There were opportunities for these guys and um, I think there was some positive signs out of that. Tanner Brun's another one who slipped in and played 19 games in his first year. So in terms of negative, missing out on finals with a list that strong uh, is not great. It's the first time since 2015, if I'm not mistaken, and, then, and the second time since 2006. So a wonderfully successful club. It, it had to happen at some point. Uh, three losses to GMHBA is really, really rare. I don't know when the last time that was the case for the Cats. They lost to Frio, the Dogs, and Giants there this year. And of course, you know, the retirements, are, I suppose, are a negative with Smith and Menegola. Uh, Menegola was actually their highest disposal winner this year as well. So the transition is uh, beginning slash continuing. Overall, I'm going to give the Cats a D minus. I think they were considerably better than Richmond this year. I know Richmond beat them, but percentage of 112 shows that they were at least closer to the mark and it was just a really poor end of the season. So maybe I'm being a little bit of a double standard Darren. That's not a real thing. Uh, but I rate Richmond's season a little bit more disappointing than Geelong's. Primarily probably because of the trades for Taranto and Hopper. Now let's talk about Essendon who uh, I've had their preseason expectation first year under Brad Scott, bottom four last year. I thought push for finals would have been maybe a bold expectation. So I had top 10 and they finished 11. So just missed out on that. Um, had some good wins this year. They beat the Demons in round five at Adelaide Oval. That was a surprise. Their dream time win over Richmond was good. They beat Carlton this year, beat the Crows later in the year when you know finals was up for grabs. Their big win in round one against Hawthorne. So some real genuine season highlights in there. Some of their losses were really diabolical though. The, the Giants was their fifth biggest loss ever, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, their Fremantle loss in Perth, I think they didn't lose by that much, but it wasn't, wasn't the best showing either. And then in round 24, again, a really, really poor way to end the season um, by losing to the Pies in that fashion. Pretty uncompetitive, but lots of positives, lots of negatives at the same time. We'll start with the positives. Uh, they were actually fifth in the league for disposals this year and second in marks. Another interesting stat was they were actually first in least. Another interesting stat was they actually had the least opponent tackles on them this year. You know, in terms of positives, they climbed out of the bottom four and were still mathematically a possibility for finals in the final round. So some clear improvement under Brad Scott. We saw them playing some good footy. Uh, in terms of individuals, Nick Martin had a career best year. He was fantastic as a wingman. Carl Langford as well, going forward and kicking 51 goals. Goals is, uh, is an outstanding effort. Um, on top of that, they're probably going to keep Darcy Parrish and Mason Redman, who were probably their two biggest free agency headaches. Assuming Parrish stays, uh, I'll count that as a positive. Uh, negative is the terrible end of the year. They nearly lost the North. They nearly lost the West Coast. And then, as I mentioned, the Giants and Pies performances were poor. They were also bottom four in terms of conceding inside 50s, which was interesting. They were the second worst clear inside, the third worst tackling side. So some clear numbers that Essendon need to improve on. But there are lists with, with some developing young talent. And I think they took some steps forward. I'm really hoping that their end of the season doesn't carry on into next year. It was a really bad way to end the season. But at the same time, some positives there. And I don't think it's a bad best 22. I'm giving Essendon a C. Uh, I would have probably graded them better. I think they hit their expectations. It's just that the poor end of the year really put a sour note on it. We've got two games to go and I have got the Adelaide Crows next, whose expectation I think would have been to push for finals. And uh, therefore I've sort of hit that threshold as top 10 and that's where they finish. And obviously, obviously, controversially, probably should have made the finals. What were their best wins this year? They beat the power twice. That's got to be nice for them. They smashed Carlton and St Kilda at times where Carlton and St Kilda looked pretty good earlier in the season as well. And they really flexed their muscle. Worst losses, they weren't really terrible ones, but losing, uh, I think it was round two to the Tigers in Adelaide. You know, in hindsight, that's not a great win. And uh, probably their Ballarat game against the Dogs. But overall, not a huge gap between their best and worst this year, I'd say. Um, some positives, there's heaps for Adelaide. They were the number one scoring team and they didn't make finals, which is, a very very rare I think it's the first time that's ever happened in the AFL era they scored more points than goals this sounds like a negative but they actually kicked more behinds than than goals in 12 out of their 23 games this year so when you're the number one scoring team and you're probably quite inaccurate that's actually pretty scary their percentage was still 117 which is outstanding I think it's going to be a good indicator for Adelaide next year the showdown dominance uh, their home ground kind of a fortress at least they played some scintillating footy there their form versus the best teams as well is a really 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 good indicator for next year as well two close losses against the pies obviously smashed port twice they nearly beat the demons they nearly beat the lions both of those last two were away from home as well so some really good form there individuals jordan dawson's gonna be probably all australian Tex walker was second in the common um turning back the clock once again and uh, finally they improved from 14th so a whole host of positives for adelaide what were their negatives uh i put unconvincing away form at times but uh, to be fair I, I think they kind of mitigated this by nearly knocking off some of the best teams away from home as well but yeah the sun's loss the dog's loss 
doesn't really show how good Adelaide were this year. Close losses as well. I mean, again, some of those were against really good teams, but left some points out on the table and some bad luck as well. Man, if only Ben Keys could kick straight, huh? Other negatives, uh, they were robbed of finals. Let's, let's call it what it is. I don't really want to dwell on it, but we have to acknowledge they should have made finals. Uh, and injuries hit the back line pretty hard, but to be fair, I think they did a pretty good job of uh, upholding their end of the bargain there. Overall, uh, might be controversial. I'm giving Adelaide an A for this season. I think purely because of the indicators that they've got project to me like a team that could potentially finish top four next year. Um, that's probably my early bold prediction. They're a bad decision away out of finals. Making finals this year would have been you know, a massive tick. And I think the way they play the game and the, the, the list profile and the star talent and that forward line, I think Adelaide is an A. Finally, we've got the Western Bulldogs, a team that had a really disappointing end to the year, had to wait to the final match day of the season to watch GWS beat Carlton. They'll probably be filthy about that, but I'm sure even the Dogs fans are thinking, no, we probably didn't deserve to play finals because we lost to West Coast last week. But preseason expectation, I would have said top six. This is a mature list. It's a star-studded list. You've got Bontempelli and a whole host of other stars in that midfield. Honestly, like if they hadn't finished eighth last year, I would have said this, this list should be aiming for top four. But regardless, they finished ninth. Um, some of their best wins, they beat the Lions at Marvel earlier this year. They've won at GMHBA in the final round, albeit against a depleted cat side. And their win over the Crows, they flex some muscle in Ballarat. Worst losses, round one against the Ds, they were pretty uncompetitive. Round two against the Saints, they lost by 51 points. It was a really poor start to the season. Then later in the season, they lost to Hawthorne, they lost to West Coast, and uh, they conceded a five-goal lead against GWS to ultimately lose that game. So the Dogs' fate was in their own hand this year, and they just couldn't do it. Let's focus on some positives. Fonz and Pelly's probably at the top of of his game. I think he would be a very worthy Brownlow uh, medal winner and probably my prediction right now. Liberatore was also really great in the clinches. Uh, Jamara Ugelhagen, former number one draft pick, kicked 35 goals this year and is quietly, maybe not quietly, depending on how closely you watch the Bulldogs, but he's showing a really, really good linear, linear improvement for a young key forward. He's uh, projecting as a very high talent. I'd say that the unearthing of James O'Donnell as a key defender has also been sensational. Ed Richards had a great year and Riley West as well seemed to have found a bit of a groove as a smaller forward. The negatives probably outweigh the positives this year for the Western Bulldogs, let's be honest, uh, the one that comes to mind is losing uh, to West Coast and being uh, kicked out of finals. But as I highlighted earlier in this video, they had plenty of other opportunities to win one more game. They were 7-3 and three this year and blew final from that position, which is uh, a pretty poor result, especially considering the back end of their year, the fixture wasn't particularly hard. Um, they were 6 on the expected score ladder, which is interesting, which means that they had been better at taking their opportunities with the uh, goal scoring opportunities they were presented with, they would have finished 6. But And finally, uh, you know, failing to make the top four once again under Luke Beveridge with a list this strong, I think he's a failure. And I, I think that is the consensus among the fans right now. It was a disappointing season and it sounds like Luke Beveridge is under some serious pressure. So let me know in the comments, uh, Doggies fans, what do you think? Yeah, I don't actually hear from Doggies fans too much. How do I grade them? Oh, like an F is too harsh. I'm thinking D. No, I'll go stronger than that. I'll say D minus. The Bulldogs are far too talented and, you know, contrasting it to Richmond and Geelong, their list profile and their age demographic suggest that they should be well and truly in the thick for finals, but were pretty disappointing this year. So I'll give them a D minus, certainly not an F. They did get pretty close to finals. So it wasn't a complete disaster, but undoubtedly a bit of a failure. So that's all I got guys for the 10 teams that missed the finals. As always, I welcome your input in the comments section below. Really just appreciate the support lately. If you could do me a favor and subscribe if you haven't already, that'd be much appreciated. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.